Welcome to the Financial Freedom Secrets Show. This is your host, Jackson Milan, the Wealth Mentor, helping business owners create financial freedom faster by mastering the language of money. Want to see how well you're tracking towards financial freedom? Complete our 40-point financial performance scorecard at wealthhealthcheck.com.au. That's wealthhealthcheck.com.au. The average score for most business owners is 18 out of 40. So complete the scorecard now and see how well you're tracking towards financial freedom. G'day, guys. This is Jackson Malala, the Wealth Mentor, and we're here for another episode of the Financial Freedom Secrets Show. And for those of you guys who've been following us for a while, you know that I believe that marketing and money are the two most important things that you need to master in your business. If you want to be successful in both business, but you also want to be able to predictably create financial freedom for yourself and your family. But it is the two things that most business owners abdicate responsibility for. Uh, They try and find anybody else in the world to handle their marketing and their money uh, other than themselves. And it's actually not that scary. So today I've got a new friend, Jen Donovan, who is a marketing master, particularly for rural businesses. And I know that being in the regions, um, businesses who are uh, in the, the regions typically rely on word of mouth. Uh, we like to gossip a lot in the regions. So word of mouth spreads pretty quickly. But it's a very reactive way to grow and scale your business, and it's not necessarily the best way. It's not how marketing should necessarily be done. So I'm looking forward to unpacking it and hopefully sharing some wisdom with you guys today. So Jen, thanks for joining us. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Right. Absolute pleasure. I'm looking forward to our chat today. So let's get back to your origin story, Jen. Give us a little bit of background. How did you get into small business marketing and the work that you do right now? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I guess for context, as far as the rural thing goes, I am a farmer's daughter and now I am a farmer's wife. Um, I moved to town, um, from the farm when I was about 15 and vowed and declared I'd never marry a farmer. And I met my husband probably about a year later when I was 15 and a half and, um, you know, everything else is history since then. So I have a really big passion for rural and regional small businesses. I've been one for many years. I actually started in law um, way back when I got out of uni and I did that for a few years. And and really, I guess I ran my own uh, property law firm and uh, I didn't really need to do much marketing because as you just said, you know, word of mouth, referral marketing is really good in the countries. And by the time I had, you know, a couple of good uh, referrals from real estate agents, I didn't really have to do much marketing. Um, But of course, as my story goes, my best friend and I had way too much wine to drink one night and we decided to throw in our corporate jobs. She was in disability, I was in law and we bought a shop. We bought a shop to play shop. We'd had, um, this is going back to a you know, 2009, 2008, when we were in horrific drought here in the east coast of Australia or on the eastern side of Australia, I should say. And so, you know, obviously me and uh, my law firm had been propping up the farm for quite some years. And so my husband was like, just go have some fun. You know, everything seems to be getting back to normal. So we bought a business for some fun to play shop. And then it wasn't probably long after that I realized that, hey, we could actually make this into a really good business. This is actually not too bad. Um, And we had bought a rundown gift shop. But we soon, by listening to our customers, we realized that our uh, region didn't have a kitchen shop, didn't have something for kitchenware. So that's where I found, kind of found my love for being a small business owner and learnt about marketing. I guess I always had a mentor that sort of helped me along that track. And when I sold that business seven years later, I actually went and worked for my mentor and did the social media side of that marketing business. And we travelled all around Australia doing workshops and um just different things like that. Uh, And I was sort of on the social media side and he was on the marketing side. And we did that for a couple of years. And then basically my small family, I just was away a lot. So I wanted to come home and spend more time with my family. And so I created this business, which is Social Media and Marketing Australia. And that was about seven years ago. And I've been Talking about marketing since uh, I talk about it until someone tells me to be quiet. Um, And I just, yeah, I just love it. And I love helping small rural and regional businesses because I feel that it is different when you run a business in the country to running a business in metropolitan cities. Um, And that's why I kind of wrote my book that I wrote last year. And yeah, I'm just, those two passions just clash. And yeah, that's what I love doing. I love it, mate. This is fantastic. And 
<laughs> it's interesting to see the contrast between yourself being someone from the regions who saw the value of referral marketing, of just doing a good job and allowing the opportunities to come in, but then your passion for marketing then leading you down this path. Mm -hmm. But that isn't very common in the regions, it seems. And um, I've spoken about this a couple of times on my show. Um, where we live, there's kind of a, a strip, as most uh, kind of uh, areas do, where all of the shops are. And there was one particular business that was there for quite a long while who then subsequently wrapped up and made a very kind of assertive post in the kind of community Facebook group, essentially pointing the finger at the community for their failure, essentially saying, you didn't support us and you went and did X, Y, Z, and it's your fault that we're having to close our business. And it really hit me. And I, firstly, I felt sorry for them, of course, to be in that perspective and obviously to fail. Failing's not nice, but it's an inevitable part of business. We all fail. But mm -hmm. on the flip side, it was like, well, what could have this business done differently? And I'm sure you see that kind of similar perspective all the time. So my first question oh, exactly. is, why is there such a stigma around marketing in the regions? Why do so few regional businesses take take pride and put a lot of effort into their marketing, do you think? Look, I suppose it depends on what business you're looking at as such. But um, I totally agree. Like there's many businesses in my hometown. It's kind of like, well, the door's open. Where are you? Like that's their attitude. Like I opened the door for people. Uh, but unfortunately for winter, most of the doors are closed, which is another bugbear of mine. But, you know, we won't get into that so much. But I find that probably a lot of it is because they're sole openers. There's a lot of small business owners who the business is them. They are their business. And without sounding like I'm sort of downgrading them at all, they've kind of bought themselves a job at the end mm. of the day. Maybe they wanted to work for themselves and, you know, it is kind of a job that they're attached to. The business can't work without them uh, and all of that sort of comes into it. And I often find, because I do a lot of workshops around the regions and people are like, oh, can we do it at breakfast? Because I can't leave my business. You know, I'm the only one who works there. Or can we do it at night? And all of that. And I really appreciate that that is their circumstance, but I think that has a lot to do. They are so busy working in the business that actually working on it becomes an after hours activity, which then just, you know, is their cup's too full at the end of the day. For me, yes. I would say that's probably one of the biggest reasons is because they're it's only them. And hence, when your intro, you were talking about marketing is something we often outsource. And I think, again, that becomes an issue. They outsource their marketing. That person doesn't understand their business, their, you know, their business model, who their ideal client is. So they get bad results from that. So then that becomes like, I wasted my money on the marketing. And then we come back to the vicious cycle of not doing any marketing. Yes, it becomes this dichotomy. And look, I've made this mistake myself. I remember when I was growing my business and it was very much growing off referral primarily. And then I'm like, okay, we need to do more marketing because we want to grow faster as many business owners do. And then you hire an agency and you're like, look, I'm too busy. Just go and do your marketing thing and generate me leads. And they're like, wait a minute, like tell me your customer avatar. What's your positioning? Like, And it took me so many years and so much wasted money that I got to a point where I realized no one's ever going to understand my market like I do. And sure, a marketer might have the strategies and tactics to implement that, but they need my messaging and they need to be able to have my brand and assets to be able to go and generate me those ideal customers. So that then continues on to what are the biggest marketing faux pas and mistakes that you see regional businesses make aside from kind of abdicating responsibility to an agency? Um, I think uh, personally that it's doing what they only see as free marketing. So mm. they only, they just post on social media, like, you know, Facebook and Instagram, you know, quite often I'll talk to someone and it's like, well, what marketing do you do? Oh, I post on social media. And it's like, okay, what else do you do? And posting on social media might be great. If you look at your Google Analytics and that's driving all your traffic to your website, great, fantastic, happy days. But if it's not and you're not doing any other marketing, then I think it becomes a little bit like that social media post you were talking about earlier where unfortunately they can't see the forest for the trees or the trees for the forest. I never know which one that goes with. And, you know, it's somebody else's fault that 
it happened. Um, so I think that's kind of like one of the things is just relying on a free medium. And look, you know, elephant in the room, it's not free. You're worth so much an hour. So technically the hours you are spending on social media, that is your marketing budget, which leads me to the second point is no marketing budget. You know, uh, there's, what do they say? I think 10% of your turnover should be spent on marketing. I would probably challenge anyone listening to this to look at your figures and go, do you spend anywhere near 10% of your turnover on marketing. You know, most of the time it's half a percent or one percent, uh, which is great if you are going where you want to go in business. But if you wanted to grow or scale, then potentially you need to look at other avenues for, you know, how you can have that marketing budget and spend it wisely and spend it well. Um, so they would be the two biggest things. And sometimes I think also having the wrong person in your ears, you know, we do, you said, you know, we do like to talk in uh, the regions and you do talk to people and, you know, Jane from down the road, you know, she did this really great thing on Meta and so I'm going to go and do that without thinking about, well, have we got the same ideal client? Have we got the same outcome? Like, what am I looking for? What's she looking for? And sometimes it's the wrong person in your ears giving you advice or even worse still, sometimes there's too many people in your ears giving advice and you're just confused. Yes, and it's so common, right? Because look, marketing, like any subject, uh, it's complicated. There's a lot to it. And I think this is why education is so important. And abdication is about not having an understanding of kind of having that blind leap of faith. There's nothing wrong with outsourcing as long as you do so from a position of having like some level of education and understanding of the 100%. why behind what you're actually doing before then you just go and say, hey, here's the keys to the vault. Go and spend all of my money on marketing as a blind leap of faith. <laughs> so that makes a lot of sense. And it's interesting. It reminds me, I remember speaking to this regional account actually, and uh, he, we were going through his P&L and we're talking about his marketing spend. And he said, oh, yeah, I'm posting on social media. What do you do? And he uh, set up, he's like, oh, I automated it. We, it posts like all of multiple times a day. And I'm like, okay, let's go have a quick look. And he'd set up some sort of RSS feed for all of these news websites that was posting just all of this crap that had absolutely wow. nothing to do with, with accounting. And I'm like, mate, you should probably go chat to your marketing guy about getting this sorted. So uh, we've seen some things in our day as well. I'm sure you have too. So uh, on the flip side, Jen, let's talk about what a great marketing strategy looks like for a regional business owner. What are the kind of most the, the most valuable contributing parts to creating a, a winning marketing strategy? Yeah, again, it depends on what sort of business. And, you know, I hate starting every sentence with that, but it is sort of important to think about context. Um, if you take someone who perhaps is B2C, so uh, business to consumer, although I think everyone should be B2H, business to humans. But anyway, if you're more on the retail consumer side, sometimes um, their strategy is to sell and sell and sell and sell and sell. And so every time you open your social media or open an email or see a piece of marketing from them, all they're doing is selling to you. And you kind of, you know, no one likes to be sold to all the time. And then there's the flip side potentially of uh, the other business owner who is so great at giving information and so good at tips and tricks and really like starting with value, but they never finish giving value and they never actually ask for the sale. So there's kind of, I, I find looking at people's marketing, there's you're in one camp or the other, you never sell or you're always selling. So somewhere in the middle is where we, of course, need to be. Um, but there is that, so there is a sales strategy that we need. I think storytelling is a really important part of uh, connecting with your community. And I, again, I talk about community, not audiences. Audience is someone you talk at. A community is something you're involved in. So I think it's really important to flip our thinking of how many followers do we have? How many people are, you know, liking our posts? Like, well, who really cares? How are you building community? How are you putting a picket fence around the people who know, like, and trust you? So there is that element of um, brand awareness. So that storytelling that is really important because, you know, people love to hear your story and people will buy from people, you know, they find a common element with. So hiding behind a logo or hiding behind a brand just isn't the way to market yourself in 2024 and really hasn't been for quite some years. But I think it's getting more and more as big business you know, penetrates our communities more and more. That's the thing we've got over them is, you know, we can move quickly and we've got a unique story that we can talk about. Um, 
And then there is, I guess, so we've got sales strategy, we've got brand awareness, engagement, like actually doing some things that people will want to comment back or reply back to an email or, you know, uh, share a piece of marketing you've done with their community. You know, maybe it's like quite valuable there as well. Um, And then on top of that, of course, you've got your lead generation strategy that I talk about. So how are you growing your leads as such? So is that, is email marketing important uh, to you? Well, how on earth are you building that email list Um, and and other types of lead generation that you might be doing as well? So they're kind of like the four big elements, but the one that I think most people skip is the human to human, that brand awareness, that storytelling, which is just so powerful. And I think if you're in a regional community, it's kind of almost a superpower if you're not already doing it. I agree. Yeah. A big part of our marketing strategy is the storytelling element and creating the the kind of the persona that sits behind the brand. Isn't that the interesting thing, right? You look at the biggest businesses in the world who have these kind of faceless brands, right? And they spend like millions upon millions upon millions of dollars trying to persona uh, personify those brands with ambassadors and certain campaigns that they do that try and create kind of a, a connection to to their brand. But the great thing about being a small business owner is that we very much are the brand. And the interesting thing I often get is like everyone recognizes I do that in my own strategy. But they're like, oh, but I don't have as interesting life as you. Like I don't live on a farm that I don't have an animal sanctuary. I'm not doing all of this crazy stuff. Do people need to be doing crazy stuff to tell good stories and to create that connection with their audience? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And I think also as small business owners, we really undervalue what we know that other people would like to know. And we really undervalue our own stories as such. Like one of the biggest, like every few months, I'll introduce myself again to my audience because I think that's really important because you're always getting new followers, you're always getting new subscribers, things like that. And, And one of the biggest things that I tell people about myself, which is so ridiculously small, is that I don't drink coffee. Well, the coffee people come for me. Well, how do you start your day and what do you do and how do you cope and why don't you like coffee? Have you ever tried it? And it's the simplest thing and yet it creates that, that I guess, that part of that community. It cre- creates a response. And, and yes, it has nothing to do with my business as such, but it has to do with me and it's part of my, I guess, human-to-human marketing, part of my brand awareness. So it can be something as simple as that. Um, you know, I tell people I'm a justice of the peace and they're like, how on earth is a marketer? a justice of the peace, which then allows me to tell my story of, you know, how I started in law and just different things like that. I think you don't need to pick out huge elements. You can pick out really small ones and share those. Makes so much sense. It's funny. It reminds me of a friend of mine who did a very similar thing in terms of the coffee thing. And he made a post on his social media that said, oh, good morning to everyone except for those who drink oat milk. And uh, it was, it was, he's now known as the oat milk guy, right? It, it caught fire and it was very, very polarizing. But I think it's a really great example, right? You don't need to be polarizing. I tend to lean a little bit more that way that I'm very outward facing in terms of my, my opinion on things and I'm very vocal. You don't have to be that kind of person, but I think it's important to have an opinion and to share the things that you do and the things that you believe And they're not necessarily to get people offside, but they provide contrast to an otherwise kind of like mundane experience that many people have, right? Um, And and I think that that contrast is really important, particularly if you have competition. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, And like you say, it doesn't have to be controversial. You don't need to be, you know, excluding, you know, one group at the, you know, exclusion of all others, but it's you. Like, Is that the type of thing you would talk about, you know, if you went to a networking event or at the pub on a Friday night or something like that, it's you, it's part of your personality then yeah, share it. And people will say to me, you know, Jen, you share so much online. I don't think I could share as much as you, but the reality is I share a very small amount of my life online. Like my life is a bountiful, but I share what I'm comfortable with. And over the years, that's definitely shifted. Prior to the pandemic, I probably wouldn't have told you I live on a farm um, because I didn't think that, I thought if people didn't know that I lived in the capital cities, would they take me seriously? And it was almost the gift of the pandemic was like, oh, now everyone knows that online's okay. I used to have people, private clients travel from Melbourne three and a half hours to do sessions with me because they wanted to do it in person. Pandemic hit, 
they had no choice and they learned that, you know, Zoom's really powerful as well. You know, we can do these three things through Zoom. So, you know, I've changed over the years and I think if you are just willing to sort of push yourself just a little bit outside your comfort zone to share some things, you'll get some good reaction. And then of course, you'll be willing to share a little bit more and a little bit more, but I'm um, always only share what you're comfortable with. Yeah, I really agree. Mine's definitely evolved over the years. I, I mm. refer back to this all of the time because when people ask me about, oh, Jackson, you're so well polished on video and you speak so well. And, and I'm like, this is like, I've been doing this for over a decade. And yeah. I wish I kept my first video I uploaded to YouTube. I deleted it because it was so cringy and I wish I didn't because <laughs> it would have been the best teaching teaching experience for anybody who asks me about this stuff um, because it's just, it's so important, right, that you just, yeah. it's a constant evolution. And I find it's cathartic, right, of being able to document your journey and to share your experience and um, share your vulnerability, share your wins, particularly when you are in the regions, people, people watch very, very mm -hmm. closely. And, yeah. um, and it, it, it is a really powerful tool, uh, at least yeah. to keep you top of mind and relevant, if nothing else. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I say to people, you know, if there's someone you're comparing yourself with, you know, don't compare yourself where they are and you are if they're streets ahead of you. But Instagram mm -hmm. sometimes can be really good about for that. You know, scroll back a few years. Like, you know, for myself, you know, if I scroll back three years ago, four years ago and watch Amy Porterfield's video, she's not near as polished as she is in 2024. She's more like I was, you know, what I am now and what she was back then. That's where I need to compare myself not to the person that exists now that, you know, has big budgets, done this for, you know, a decade, et cetera, yes. et cetera. So, yeah. Great advice. Good point. And, mate, there's a really contentious part of marketing, and I've already touched on it already, but I'd love to get your thoughts on this, is the idea of a customer avatar. And I know from first-end experience, my own rebuttals on it were that, okay, well, sure, I want to have a, a person, a specific person that I want to work with, but I can help everyone. And mm -hmm. I always, I made the issue very early on of being too vague with my positioning and not really dialing in that avatar. So what's your perspective of creating custom avatars and niches, particularly in the regions? Yeah, look, I think niches have a bit of a bad rap in some ways. Uh, you know, as a marketer, should I niche down into email marketing? You know, as a clothing person, should you niche down in just to men's workwear boots type of thing? Like, I don't think that's quite the niche we're looking for when we talk about niches. It works for some businesses, but I think that, you know, my niche is, you know, small business owners that have been in business three to five years. Like, mm. it, it niches down from there into rural and regional potentially, but it's not, you know, it's not really, really thin. And I think sometimes um, we do think about niching a little bit too thin, but as far as the ideal client goes, it took me a lot of years when I was in retail to even take that stuff seriously. I would turn up to my mastermind sessions like, ugh, this again. And I'd scribble down some things on a piece of paper. And I, I think I ignored it. You know, what is that thing? Um, when the student is ready, the teacher appeared. And then I yes. one day it just kind of struck me. It was like, oh, now I get it. And so I get that, you know, people are kind of like, oh, I've heard that stuff before. I'm not doing that. But I can tell you hand on heart, most businesses, I'd say about 90% of businesses who come to me to get a marketing strategy done or some marketing coaching, we have to start back there. Who is your who? What do you want to be famous for? And where do those people hang out? Like they're the three marketing questions. If you get those right, along with messaging and a few other things, but it just makes marketing so much more simpler. Uh, but if you are trying to market to everyone, of course you're confused because every time you write a message, it, it didn't land with anyone. It was kind of mediocre for everybody. But if you just you know, spoke to that one person, yes, you might attract people outside of that. And I think that's everyone's fear. But if I niche down to that one person, my business, you know, won't grow as fast or things like that, where the reality is really quite, um, you know, sorry, the opposite is really quite the reality at the, in the end is if you can talk to that one person, you'll probably attract other people, but your marketing messaging will just land so much better with that person. That's sage advice, mate. And look, I can testify for that. We 
dragged our heels with that for so long, thinking of that same thing. Like we're going to repel people who would otherwise we would be able to help. But we found the more specific we were in our messaging, not only did it hit the mark, but we also found that there were people who were outside of our positioning who would come and say, hey, I'm actually not a business owner or I'm not at six or seven figures. I'm this kind of person, but I really resonate with what you say. Can you help me? And this Mm -hmm. now puts you in a position where you can make a choice. For some of those people, they aren't a good fit, and then we refer them on. But for some of them, they actually are. And we can say, hey, Jen, actually, you don't necessarily fit the exact mold, but I think we speak the same language, and I really think we can help you. This is how this can look. And it's a really Mm -hmm. powerful position to be in, and we grow our business so much faster once we really implement those principles that you spoke of. So, guys, if you're listening or watching this, I highly advocate it. And get the support to work through that because sometimes you can't see uh, can't see all of the details when you're inside the box. You need that external perspective that can help you coax it out. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And again, I think so many people think that they've done it once, uh, you know, and that's kind of oh, I've done that activity. But the reality is, it's something that needs to be keeping updating. Like you know, as a consumer, I change all the time. So you know, I'm different people are targeting me at different times, and you know. Sometimes I'm ready to buy. Sometimes I aren't because the message isn't quite there for me yet. But so it is something you need to keep revisiting, not just do once. And it's kind of a set and forget thing. And it goes all the way over. You know, I was um, looking at someone's website the other day and it, they you know, wanted to target a particular person and say it was a small business owner. Well, nowhere on their website could I see the word small business owner. So nowhere was I getting the head nod test. So it's just like, oh, this website's for me. Yes, because I'm a small business owner. So sometimes we just need an outside perspective, like you said, you know, we're so close to it. We're so in it that we don't realize that, you know, that one or 2% worth of changes are the things that we need to help elevate our messaging. Love it, mate. Fantastic. So we've covered a lot of gold in this podcast, but if somebody's listened to watch this and they want to get in touch to have a conversation around how you might be able to help them create that marketing strategy and coach them through it, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Yeah, absolutely. So if they're podcast listeners, they might like to go and listen to the Small Business Made Simple podcast. Um, Otherwise, my website is socialmediaandmarketing.com.au and I'm pretty much Jen Donovan anywhere on the socials. And if you are listening and you connect in social, please let me know. Please send me a little message. Say, hey, I heard you on the podcast uh, because, you know, I would love to hear that as well. And, uh, of course, pass that on to Jackson. Say, hey, this person listened. Yay. (laughs) Amazing. Fantastic, mate. Well, so guys, remember a good idea in theory remains exactly that, just a good idea until you put it into practice. So make sure you jump on those links. The details will be in the show notes. Reach out to Jen if you'd like to further the conversation. Jen, thanks for making the time. I really appreciate you sharing your wisdom and hopefully we can get some more regional businesses crushing it with their marketing. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much, Jackson. Catch you soon.